You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. I'm going to open this week's show with a quick shout out to all my listeners in Missouri, the show me state. Also at the moment, the show me your recently elected Republican governor being led away in handcuffs state. Governor Eric Greitens ran as an outsider in 2016. He ran as a family values pro-lifer and he ran as, well, let's just listen to one of his campaign ads. I'm a Navy SEAL and I'll take dead aim at politics as usual. I'm Eric Greitens. If you're ready for a conservative outsider, I'm ready to fire away. NRA-backed gun nut. The sound you hear at the end of that campaign ad, all that boom, 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 booming, is Greitens firing an automatic weapon at a can of gasoline. And this gun-humping family values crusader, he was arrested last week on a felony charge of privacy invasion. You can find his mugshot now on the internet. The married father of two's legal woes stem from, I hope you're all sitting down for this, an affair he had in 2015 with a married woman. He probably could have gotten away with the affair if he hadn't bound this woman to some workout equipment in his basement using duct tape and then blindfolded this woman and then taken nude photographs of this woman without her consent, photos he threatened to release on the internet if she ever told anyone about the affair that they were having. She told just one person, her then-husband, now her ex, who violated her privacy by secretly recording a phone conversation he had with her about the reasons for their divorce, which included the affair with Greitens, and then releasing those conversations to the media. So bondage, not a crime, but blackmail, revenge, porn, and in Missouri, invading someone's privacy, a crime. Greitens is refusing to resign, and the GOP in Missouri is blaming his legal problems on the all-purpose left-wing boogeyman, George Soros. Somehow, George Soros, billionaire, forced Eric Greitens' Navy SEAL to tie up his lover and take nude photographs of her without her consent and then threaten her with them. Meanwhile, over in Australia, the deputy prime minister and the head of one of Australia's largest political parties, the National Party of Australia, this guy named Barnaby Joyce, he had to resign last week after the news broke about an affair that he was having with a staff member. Joyce, married father of four, would be a Republican if he was an American politician, family values, conservative crusader, is leaving his wife, the mother of his four children so far, for a woman half his age because that woman, that former staffer, is pregnant. Same-sex marriage was just legalized in Australia after a really divisive and unnecessary public vote. And one of the loudest voices urging Australians to reject marriage equality... Barnaby Joyce, because he's a family values guy, he mouthed all the usual arguments against marriage equality. Marriage is about religion. Never mind that straight atheists are allowed to marry. Marriage is about children. Never mind that straight married couples can remain childless without having their marriage licenses revoked. And marriage is about monogamy. Never mind that straight married couples are free to practice ethical non-monogamy or, as in Mr. Joyce's case, non-ethical non-monogamy. But you do have to give Joyce credit for pushing one new and novel argument against marriage equality. If Australia legalizes same-sex marriage, Asians won't want to eat Australian cows. Seriously, Joyce argued during the campaign that marriage equality would hurt Australia's cattle industry, their beef exports, because Asians are conservative and won't want to eat gay-married Australian beef. Jumping back to the United States, married conservative family values, Utah State Rep. John Stannard resigned late last month after it was reported that he had hired a prostitute, a female one, more than one, and more than once, paid for hotel rooms to meet up with these prostitutes with government funds, and did all this despite having backed, loudly backed, and called for and stumped for legislation upping penalties for sex work. Three family values politicians, three affairs, bondage, blackmail, unplanned pregnancies, sex workers, Government corruption, I am amazed, not by the fact that these family value types keep getting exposed as moralizing hypocrites, that happens all the time. What's amazing is that we've had three in a row, 
three family values conservative men exposed as hypocrites, and not one, not one, was caught with a dick in his mouth. They're yours, straight people. Three breeders. Nice change of pace. All right, coming up on today's show, tons of your cues, lots of my A's on the free micro edition of the Savage Lovecast and on the Magnum subscription edition of the Savage Lovecast that you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com. Twice as long and no ads. We've got Emily Best here from Seed and Spark and the genius behind a new web series called Fuck Yeah! Modeling Enthusiastic Consent. That's on the Magnum coming up. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Active. Active produces audio-based fitness workouts, programs, and challenges created by certified expert personal trainers available online and through their mobile app so you can work out just the way you like. New members get 50% off an annual membership plan featuring unlimited workouts. Visit Aptiv.com slash savage and the discount will be automatically applied during checkout. That's A-A-P-T-I-V dot com slash savage. Hashtag open. Love the players. Change the game. Get ready for a new inclusive approach to social networking and modern dating. Hashtag open welcomes you as you are. Define and redefine yourself in terms that work for you. Choose your own labels or choose no labels at all. Browse solo with a partner or both all from the same phone. Hashtag open needs Savage Love listeners to test their app before they come out to the rest of the world. Test now at hashtag open.com and earn community founder status for life. Let me be me and you can be you at hashtag open. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first order with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash savage. Uh, hi, Dan. I am a late 20s queer human. And um, so the situation I'm calling about is I became, I guess, what you would be calling a unicorn, a third for uh, a slightly older couple. Um, it was a really beautiful way that the whole thing started, and they um, invited me to come live with them. Um, and it was at a time when I didn't have a place to live and couldn't really afford a house. And so I moved in with them and things were really great and wild and exploratory and fun at first. Um, but I didn't really know my level of, I guess, bisexuality at the time. And I kind of realized that things weren't really working out with the woman. It's a um, heterosexual or not heterosexual, they're both bisexual, but it's a couple, uh, male and female. And um, I, over time, kind of extracted myself from the sexual relationship with them, which was really tough, especially for the woman. I think I kind of broke her heart. She had a lot of strong feelings for me, but I continued to live with them and we were all really honest with each other and working through all of that um, step by step and came to the point where I could be a best friend living with them that they were still supporting uh, financially in the sense of giving me a place to stay and, you know, cooking for me. And so it's been, I, I moved out for a while, then I moved back in with them and I'm with them now and things are becoming really stressed because we're living in really small, close quarters together. And I'm just working, trying to get my creative career off the ground, but still not bringing in an income. And I'm feeling very kind of selfish and like I haven't been attentive to a lot of their needs and I feel like I'm using them like I don't want to be a leech I love them so much but I also need so much time right now to myself and I don't really have the time in this space and um, I just want to kind of get your thoughts on at what point does that kind of imbalance and power in a relationship turn into something that is not healthy and is this a kind of like, what, what can I do to salvage this relationship? I'm feeling there's a lot of stress and there's also a lot of insecurity on all of our parts about how that power dynamic is playing out. But at the same time, they still say that they want me here. And I do really love living here and I don't have the means to move out right now. So you're not fucking them anymore. And it sounds like you're so busy trying to get your creative career off the ground that you're not doing for them anymore. You're not doing chores around the house. You're not making yourself available emotionally or socially 
to provide them with something in exchange for everything that they're providing you. Yeah, no wonder it's a fucking stress fest at that house. You don't want to be a leech. And it sounds like they've invited you to come back knowing that it wasn't a sexual commodified exchange any longer. Used to be that you were the kept boy. Now you're the sitcom friend who lives in the house who doesn't contribute dick or groceries or maintenance or gardening or house cleaning or anything. Yeah, dude, you need to move the fuck out. This is going to be a stress test. I don't know why they invited you to come back and live with them uh, again in the first place, unless they perhaps felt responsible for you in some way, or they genuinely felt affection for you and wanted to help you because they had the space, perhaps not the physical space, the emotional space to support you at this time. You're trying to get your creative career off the ground. But if you're trying and trying and trying and trying and not really getting anywhere, then you're going to have to do what most creative people do and get a fucking job that allows you to pursue your creative pursuits when you're not working, but that makes it possible for you to provide for yourself and stop living off this couple's generosity. And if not a job and moving out and finding a room and finding another space, then you need to go to them and say, I'm going to make more time available to you guys emotionally or socially or chore wise so that there's something in this for you too. Cause right now you're just taking and taking and taking and they're giving and giving and giving, and maybe they think of themselves as giving people and want to be giving and genuinely still have affection for you. But even in a circumstance like that, where you're giving to someone that you like and want to give to, if you give and give and give and give and you get nothing in return, and it really does sound like they're getting nothing from you in return, not the dick they were getting at the outset of this relationship, not chores, help, FaceTime, anything from you right now, because you hardly see them, you're so busy with your creative pursuits, yeah, you need to go to them and, and work that out. If not, making time in your busy creative pursuit schedule for a job that allows you to support yourself like most creative types do before their creative work provides them with enough income to support themselves, then prioritizing yard work, cleaning, whatever it is that they need from you so that they feel like they're not being exploited. So they feel like they haven't invited a leech into their house and into their lives. Don't want to feel like a leech? Don't leech. Blue Apron is the leading meal kit delivery service in the United States. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. With Blue Apron, your meals contain farm fresh seasonal produce, meat with no added hormones, sustainably sourced seafood, and other solid wholesome ingredients to help you make delicious chow for yourself in your own kitchen at home. You'll be able to whip up great meals all in under 45 minutes and without a trip to the grocery store. They offer a two-person plan, a family meal plan, and a wine plan. It's convenient, flexible, and super high quality. Blue Apron helps you save time, money, and keeps you eating healthy. Terry and I love it. We made a Blue Apron for dinner last night, and we both think that you should give it a try. Coming up on the menu this month, spicy smoked trout sandwiches with roasted sweet potatoes and Caribbean chicken pea curry with roasted cabbage and rice. And Blue Apron is treating Savage Lovecast listeners to your first three meals, a $30 value with your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash savage. So check out this week's menu and get your $30 offer with free shipping at blueapron.com slash savage. Blue Apron, their tagline is a better way to cook. But for me, Blue Apron is quite literally the only way I have ever cooked. Hey, Dan and the uh, tech savvy at risk use. I am struggling with the Madonna horror complex. It's something that has been become apparent to me in the, in the recent couple of months. I've been reading more about it and I'm just not sure what to do. I think I might have the Madonna horror complex and I've heard you talk about it. How do I, I'm just lost. I just don't know what, what to do. How do I deprogram from that programming? I really need some help here. I've destroyed a lot of relationships and uh, I don't want to destroy any more. I, I, I'm single now and I'm scared to get another relationship. This is probably something you need to work on with a shrink. The Madonna Heart Complex is typically beaten into people's heads by religious traditions, by family, 
by what was modeled for them by their parents and uprooting that and tearing that out and solving the earth in which that grew, that is a process that's going to take a little bit of time and the kind of in-depth exploration and interrogation, self-interrogation, that a therapist can provide you with, not a snarky asshole with a sex advice podcast. That said, and, and here's my run at it, you have to accept that people are complex and contradictory. Men who have Madonna whore complexes, they value women for their purity. So you want to put the Madonna up on the pedestal and you feel like only that Madonna is worthy of your love. That a woman earns your love and your affection and your attention and your commitment by dint of her purity. Madonna, mother of God, a virgin, crapped out a kid, immaculately conceived by her own mother. Immaculate conception, the virgin birth, two different things. Please consult your catechism. The issue here, of course, is there are no Madonnas. Not even the Madonna was a Madonna. There was no immaculate conception. There was no virgin birth. These are myths. So if you have this Madonna whore complex, what you've done is convinced yourself that the only woman that you could ever possibly love is a woman who doesn't fucking exist. Immaculately conceived. Craps out kids after virgin. Immaculately conceived women who somehow have kids despite never having had intercourse with anyone. Those women don't exist. It really is self-defeating to invest in this myth, this idea that only a woman who is pure is worthy of your love. A whore, however, arouses you, attracts your attention. You want to be with your whore. You want to touch that whore with your dirty dick and do dirty, disgusting things with that woman that you regard as a whore. Men who have Madonna whore complexes, when this term was invented, tended to have wives that they worshipped and they put on a pedestal and they terrorized because if she did anything that could be perceived as a blemish on her Madonna status, that woman was unworthy of your love and had to be bullied back up onto that fucking pedestal. And then they had women that they had sex with. And I would say the Madonna whore thing is equal parts misogyny and self-loathing. A woman with desire and agency and experience is damaged goods, unworthy of your love and attention and affection, but also your desires. What comes out of you is disgusting. The feelings, the erections, the women you're attracted to, the women you want to have sex with, what they draw out of you is disgusting. Your desire is disgusting. Your erection is disgusting. Therefore, if you touch someone with that dirty dick of yours, the disgusting cooties are transferred from her to you. And it really is a projection of sex negativity and self-loathing onto that woman you will have sex with, onto that whore. Like I said, this is something you're going to have to work on with a therapist. Go get yourself a shrink who can peel back the layers and you can figure out how the fuck this came to be pounded into your head and how it's come to do the damage it's done to your romantic life, to your relationships. Because until you reconcile that someone can be both Madonna and whore, they can be both worthy of your love and worthy of your sexual attentions at once, you're going to be miserable and alone. And you will deserve to be alone because no woman wants to be on that pedestal, wants to be policed, wants to have to perform purity 24-7 to win your love, and no woman wants to be the object of your projected sexual disgust and self-loathing. So get thee to a therapist, go. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Aptiv. Aptiv produces audio-based workouts created by certified personal trainers available through a super useful mobile app. Aptiv makes the highest quality training available to everyone with a carefully selected group of certified personal trainers that guide you through every workout. Plus, Aptiv's in-house music production team partners with every trainer to create music playlists that are perfectly timed to the intensity and pace of your workout. When you need that extra boost, the music keeps you going and keeps you motivated. When you're ready to slow things down, the intensity of the music dials down with you. It's a flexible audio workout format, so you can work out just the way you like. And Aptiv has classes for all fitness levels, from beginner to intermediate to advanced. And with more than 2,500 workouts available on the platform and 30-plus new classes added each week, there's always a new workout to try. 
They offer a full maternity program broken down by trimester so you can work out and build strength for a healthy pregnancy and delivery and a ton of other features. Subscriptions start at $14.99, billed monthly, or $99.99 for an annual membership. For a limited time, new members get 50% off an annual membership, which is just $49.99 for the whole year of unlimited workouts. Visit aptive.com slash savage to get that discount. That's A-A-P-T-I-V dot com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I'm a 47-year-old cisgendered female. I'm getting married for the first time in April to the man of my dreams. We both come from families that are liberal politically, but otherwise conservative. We're both vanilla in everyday life with full-time office jobs, but we enjoy a deliciously kinky sex life. I'd fantasized aloud to my fiancé about working in a BDSM store, and on one of our kinky toy shopping trips, he encouraged me to ask about working there part-time. Well, I've been working there two nights per week for a little over a year, and I absolutely love it. I'm my true self there, and I really love everyone on the staff. I'm the only one with an office job and the only one whose family doesn't know that I work there. I want to invite them to my wedding, but I'm nervous about my family asking questions about who they are. They all have what my family would consider edgy looks, everything from blue hair to tattoos to nose piercings, and I'm sure my parents would wonder who they are. But they're all also really smart and kind and open, and I treasure each of them. I asked a couple of people if they'd be willing to lie about how we know each other if they come to the wedding, and they were both completely fine with it. I hated to ask them, but it's the only way I can think to make it work, and I trust all of them to keep my confidence. And by the way, my fiancé is totally supportive of inviting them, and it might even have been his idea. So Dan, what do you think? Is it too risky to invite them, the risk being that my family would find out that I'm kinky? Or should I just say, fuck it, I'm 47, these are my friends, I want them to celebrate a happy occasion with me, and my parents will be fine. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. You're 47 fucking years old. Invite whoever you'd like to invite to your wedding and stop being afraid of mommy and daddy and what they might think of your friends or how you met them. I can understand why you wouldn't want your parents to sit there at the wedding working out that you are kinky. You don't want your parents sitting at your wedding thinking about how you like to fuck your husband or whoever else you guys might be fucking. You don't want your parents thinking about it any more than your parents really want to be thinking about it, any more than you want to be thinking about your parents' sex life. So if it's going to give your sex life away to your mom and dad, and moms and dads, as my mother always liked to say, there are things they have a right not to know, then coming up with a little face-saving lie about where it is you've been working a couple of nights a week, tattoos, piercings, blue hair, all you got to do is tell your mom and dad that you're working a couple nights a week just for fun as a barista. And mom and dad will understand them as barista urban types and not question that because people typically don't look at blue hair piercings and tattoos and think kinky, think BDSM. They think urban, subculture, white folks, coffee. They make coffee. Mom and dad will buy that. Invite your friends to your wedding. And don't overthink it and don't worry about it. Have everyone agree on a cover story if your parents ask, which they probably won't. Hashtag open, love the players, change the game. Get ready for a new inclusive approach to social networking and modern dating. Instead of limiting players to the traditional models of gender identity, orientation, and relationship style, hashtag open welcomes you as you are. Define and redefine yourself in terms that work for you. Choose your own labels or choose none at all. Browse solo or browse with a partner or both, all from the same phone. Swipe or search. Players use hashtags to communicate their preferences and boundaries. Hashtag open needs you Savage Lovecast listeners to test their app before they come out to the rest of the world. Test now. You are personally invited to go test now at hashtag open.com. That's all spelled out, not the symbol hashtag H A S H. T-A-G-O-P-E-N dot com, hashtag open dot com, and you will earn, if you go now and help them test it out, community founder status for life. In addition, hashtag open is donating $1 to Planned Parenthood for every new profile in their app, up to $69,000. 
Check out their app and make a difference at the same time. Let me be me, and you can be you at Hashtag Open. Meet the Hashtag Open team at the Hump Film Festival in Eugene, Oregon, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, March 9th and 10th, and New York City, March 23rd through 29th, Cleveland, Ohio, April 7th, Madison, Wisconsin, April 14th, and Washington, D.C., April 19th through the 21st. Hi, Dan. Um, I've been reading your column since the 90s when I was a freshman at NYU, and I wish I had more of a fun question for you, but uh, here goes. I'm 40 now. I'm a bi-partnered woman in um, in the East Coast, and um, I have been trying to have a baby with my boyfriend for the past year and a half now. We've been pregnant a few times and none of them have worked out and uh, had a a couple miscarriages and a couple chemical pregnancies. The question is about sex. It's pretty hard to have a really great time trying to conceive. When we started, it was super kinky and fun because, you know, after trying not to get pregnant for 20 years and suddenly I'm trying to get pregnant, it was like, ha-ha. But... That's not the case anymore. It's become a huge chore. It's over really quickly. We have to do it every other day. And for the first time in my entire life, I find myself dreading sex and dreading intimacy. And I I guess I'm just asking, like, first of all, do you have any advice for it being more fun? And second of all, even if it can't be fun now, do you think we're doomed after hopefully we either have a successful pregnancy or, you know, stop trying to have a pregnancy and, you know, go about some other way of having a kid. Do you think we'll ever be able to get back to our fun, kinky, exciting sex life that we used to have? I really love my boyfriend and he's great, but this sex that we're having feels like it's not about me at all, uh, just about getting him off and getting him off as quickly as possible. And I feel pretty disconnected from him now when we are having sex. That's all. It's one of the things that distinguishes gay sex from straight sex is that all gay sex is recreational. I'm old enough to remember when there was a roaring cultural debate about recreational versus procreational sex. And only procreational sex was okay. Uh, And recreational sex was controversial. But in reality, most of the sex that people have most of the time is recreational. People want to have a lot more sex than they do babies. And there's this moment in the lives of opposite sex couples where many decide to shift from recreational to procreational sex, where the sex isn't about pleasure and connection and enjoyment anymore. It's not recreational. It's about the mission, which is to create the baby. And some people find, particularly if they're having difficulty conceiving or they're having miscarriages that they begin to associate sex with this painful and frustrating, sometimes often traumatizing experience. And I'm dragging Nancy onto the show because you had that kind of experience. I'm an expert. You are an expert by dint of your personal experience. Do you want to share your own story? Yeah, sure. So first of all, for those of you who are like uh, trying to conceive and are having miscarriages, and I know you're out there, if this is triggering for you, you're going to want to fast forward because it's hard stuff. I know I've been through it. I've, uh, I've got two kids. Spoiler. Everything worked out for me in the end, but uh, I had nine miscarriages. So I know, caller, I, I fucking know what you're going through. There's I really do. There's a long do. gap between the birth of your first child and the successful birth of your second child. Yeah, yeah. And there was we tried for a long time before the first one, too. So, yeah, it was a really, it, it's so hard. And I, I just, I once again, I just, I really understand what you're going through. But the first thing that I want to say to you, like right away, is... Stop having sex every other day. That is deadly. Like that is a that's that's a terrible schedule. I don't, I, I don't know if you've looked into understanding your own fertility, but there's only like four or five days when you are actually able to conceive, and there are ways of figuring out when those days are with much more accuracy. Like there are all these tools out there today that mm-hmm. allow us to do that. So this endeavor of having sex every other day, that that would be really, really hard. Most people don't even want to have recreational sex every other day. That's high libido recreational sex having. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. How do you prevent, if you've had a series of miscarriages, as you did, 
how do you prevent associating the sex that you're having right now with that potential very painful outcome when you're endeavoring to conceive and that's why you're having sex? And that must be in the back of your mind after a while that you're kind of, you may be setting yourself up again for this trauma of a miscarriage. You and, can't get that out of your head. Like give up in a way like, you know, I sort of have some unpleasant news for you, which is that as long as you're like trying to conceive and you're beginning to feel desperate, it's just not going to be that fun. But cutting cutting the frequency way down can help a lot because then at least you can look forward to it. When you know that it's going to be happening only once a month mm -hmm. and you save you save your time for then, you can build up the the excitement and the passion for having for having some sex. And but you know what? Until you like you said, caller, until you either have a kid or you take the next step and move on to adoption or, or some other way to have a kid, sex might not be that much fun. But after that phase is over and it's finite, it's going to end, it comes roaring back. It definitely does. You just got to get through this hell for now. It reminds me of uh, the kind of sex you have after you have a kid, which typically isn't great sex because you're exhausted and you're stressed out and Having an infant and a toddler is a little bit like a never-ending relay race when you're a couple and you're passing this kid back and forth. And there's not a lot of time for the greater fun or kinky or sort of extended sex you had when you were childless. That comes back itself. The opportunity for that kind of sex comes back. And it was my experience when Terry and I were parents of an infant that we had to say, it's not going to be great right now. It's going to get great later. And by just articulating that... It helped us not weld this isn't great to like the feelings of arousal or impulse. It, we, it, you know, we didn't make this association, this unbreakable association between sex and it being hurried and not really feeling connected during it because we were so stressed out and exhausted. And I imagine it must be the same sort of thing. You need to tell yourself that the sex you're having right now is you're attempting to conceive and it's a frustrating process as it was for you, as it is for the caller – don't allow that association to solidify. Don't carve it into marble. Tell yourself that this will pass, that it will come back and it will be great again. And just saying that to yourself and saying that aloud to each other makes it likelier that it will come back and it will be great again. And you have that to look forward to. If you tell yourself, oh my God, what if it's always like this? You up the chances that it will always be like this. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. That's totally true. And you can look at it with your partner as being like... Um, it's like a project you're undertaking. You guys are like, in this endeavor, it's going to end. And your your great sex life will come back. And, you know, if you actually have a kid, it's going to be even longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the paradox. Like, if you get what you want, which is a successful pregnancy, and, and you, have a, uh, you have the baby from it, then the, like, you've extended the period of the lousy sex life for at least another 16, 18, 24, 36 months. Yeah, yeah, it's true, but it, that's okay. If you if you if you actually succeed and have that baby, then it's all right. You can have maintenance sex. Yeah. During the relay race stage of your young child's life, in the same way that right now you're having purposeful, on a mission sex, which doesn't feel particularly joyful. No, but you know what can help? It helps everything. If you can have a sense of humor about it, it helps so much. If you find yourself like, oh shit, honey, I'm fertile. We have to fuck in the car right now. That's funny. Mm -hmm. And like <laughs> acknowledge it to each other. And, you know, and also, you know, it should, if you guys have a good relationship, it really should bring you closer together. God, do I sound sanctimonious right now? <laughs> But it did. It brought you and your husband closer it did. together. It definitely did. I mean, we went through, it felt like we went through like a little bit of a war together. And I mean, it helped, it helped a lot that we ended up, you know, having our kids. But just going through that with somebody, it, it should bring you together. And just keep telling yourself that you're, it just, it's going to pass. It will pass. And it sucks. And people don't understand. But I do. Can I prescribe what I often prescribe for people who are having these sorts of tense sex problems smoke some fucking pot oh yeah <laughs> did you smoke some fucking pot oh uh, no <laughs> <laughs> why not now, now i do um well at the time i wasn't as into smoking pot then as i am now listen to me i'm telling everything to you guys um yeah no i, I wasn't as into smoking pot back then and because i was on this wheel of either pregnant or recovering from a miscarriage that always felt like 
the wrong time to get high. Like if you if you're pregnant, you know, you really shouldn't be getting high if right. you're pregnant. And so there's that time when you think you just might be, you don't know yet. Mm-hmm. And the time right before. So it's kind of hard to get high. That's a hard thing. I guess if you pinpoint your preg- your fertility super well, which you should do, then yeah, you can use pot to to get your fucking done. Then stop smoking pot. And then uh, then start up again later as soon as you can. <laughs> I, have, I have one more prescription and I'm, I'm flying blind here, but and I want to know what you would think of this. If you're going to have sex just once a month during the three or four days that you're fertile or maybe a couple of times during those three or four days, would it help during the, the four weeks or three and a half weeks when you're not fertile to ha- masturbate together, to have some non-procreative, non-PIV sex that is just about pleasure, that is just about connection, just about release, and not sex on a mission. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's of course, that's a great idea. So if you're relieved from having to do it every other day because you're monitoring your fertility, don't not have some sex the rest of the time. The sex just for pleasure, the kinky fun sex that you say that you miss – Have that sex and keep his dick out of your pussy because you're not. Yeah, you got to save it up. He's got to save it up. (laughs) Get him a chastity (laughs) cock cage. Make him save it the fuck up for real. No, no, no. Don't do that unless that turns you on. That's kind of the kink you enjoy. But like mix in with the purposeful, like on a mission, grim association, potentially if you've had some miscarriages sex with some just for us, just for pleasure, just for fun, just for the connection, just for the intimacy sex. You're allowed to have that too while you're on the get knocked up mission. Good advice, Dan. You're good at this. You're good at it too. You should come on the show more often. Sometimes I wish you were my co-host and we talked all the time. And uh, congratulations on your two terrific kids. I remember what that journey was like. Uh, And I'm really happy for you. Thank you, Dan. Hi, Dan, Nancy, and the tech savvy at-risk youth. I'm a 29-year-old bi male living uh, in the East Coast, and I've been seeing somebody for about four months, I'd say, and everything is great, except she is a terrible kisser, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it or even if there is anything to do. She kisses, basically, imagine somebody just putting their face against your face and doing nothing. That is, that is effectively what she does when she kisses. She doesn't move her mouth. That, that's true for kissing anywhere. If she kisses you on the neck, anywhere, she just does nothing. Eventually, she'll get you know, warmed up and she will just open her mouth. She doesn't move her tongue. She doesn't use her tongue at all. She just stays there. She just places her face against mine and kind of does nothing. She is the same age as me and pres- I know has had serious long-term partners before. So I'm wondering, one, has she been trained to kiss in this way or is this like a way that she really likes? When we first started dating, I noticed this and I kept making a point to be like, oh, I really like it when somebody uses a lot of more tongue when they kiss me or when, you know, she kisses me on the neck or something like that. I always say, oh, it's great when you do, you know, acts kiss me with your tongue. And I always tried to sort of play up my enjoyment whenever that infrequently happened, but it, it mostly doesn't. And the sort of subtle hints kind of went nowhere. So I, I'm wondering, do I directly address the the, the shitty kissing? Or, but I feel like that's going to lead to a negative response. If she, she's, that's like a terrible thing to say, like, oh, you're a shitty kisser, especially to somebody who's presumably been making out with people for a long period of time. Or is it just, you know, she is, that's just her kissing style, and that's effectively a price of admission. Thank God you've only been dating this woman for four months. Not because at four months you can pull the plug and walk away, but you're not four years in. So that when you go to tell her, look, I don't really like the way that we kiss. This isn't really working for me. The kissing is a real problem. She doesn't have to think, oh, my God, four years, four years every time we've kissed, he's been like, ick. And now he's telling me four months in. This is the right time to go to someone and say, we need to work on kissing or that's not how I like to get blown or these positions don't work for me. You've been doing something and you know, initially you're not going to like bust out a lot of criticism. You've been getting to know each other and now's the time for an assessment. Now's the time for some constructive, not criticism engagement. You want to get on the same page about kissing. Maybe this is the way her previous boyfriends or girlfriends enjoyed being kissed. Can't imagine that, 
But maybe at, at this young age, and 29-ish is still pretty young. A lot of people are pretty inhibited in their 20s. They don't communicate well about sex in their 20s. Maybe she's just coasted along with her m- lips parted, pressed against someone's face, thinking that's kissing because no one's told her that she has muscles in her face and muscles in her lips and she should use them and it's about puckering and pressing and engaging and suction and tongue not just about a wet damp hole pressed against another wet damp hole so say to her not you're a lousy kisser say to her there's a way i like to be kissed sounds like you already broached that subject but you weren't emphatic enough and you didn't stick with it tell her there's a way i like to be kissed and we need to work on kissing because everything else is great really like you really like the sex really like the penetrative sex really like whatever else we're doing really like spending time with you but the kissing just it's really important to me and i need it to happen for me in this in this way in a more engaged active mutually participatory manner And then it's a problem you guys are going to work on together. And she's learning how to kiss differently, not because the way she kissed before was so lousy, even if it was lousy, but because there's a way you like to be kissed. And I'm sure she would like to kiss you in the way you would like to be kissed. But you can't just always in a situation like this drop hints. You got to risk being direct. Think about it. You're 29 years old. You stay with this person for the rest of your life. 50 years of this. What's going to be worse, the awkwardness of really speaking up right now in this moment or 50 fucking years of being kissed like this? Possible she doesn't like kissing. Some people do a thing badly because they don't like that thing and they don't want to have to do that thing. And they think, well, if I'm just lousy at this thing long enough, they'll stop asking for my lousy blowjobs or my awful kisses or fucking me doggy style or whatever it is that they want to do that I hate. I'll do it badly. Maybe it's that. So you should also say to her when you're having this conversation, do you just not like kissing? And that may be a price of admission that you're willing to pay. Maybe a price of admission you're not willing to pay. But if she's doing this badly because she'd really rather not be doing it, that's a whole other conversation. And she may need a whole other partner if kissing is important to you. There are people out there who don't like kissing and would rather not. But they know it's expected of them. And so they lay there with their mouths open, allowing you to kiss them. And hoping that one day you'll stop. If that's what she's up to, that's what's going on for her, you have to draw her out about it. And then that's a whole other conversation you need to have with her. There also could be other things going on. There's a million different things going to be going on. How's your oral hygiene? Maybe she doesn't want to kiss you because you don't floss and you don't brush your teeth and your breath stinks. And she's just holding her nose, closing her soft palate up against the back of her throat, closing up her sinuses and hoping that this will pass quickly. Could be you. So you have to go into that conversation prepared, not just to give criticism and instruction, constructive engagement, but also to receive it in case the issue here isn't her, but you. This is in response to the caller on episode 592, who was concerned about when to disclose that she was a virgin. Dan, she never said that the person that she was going to be losing her virginity to was the one that she wanted to spend the rest of her life with as much as she wanted to make sure that there was a certain level of emotional intimacy, which seems fair to me. My advice to her would be that if she doesn't want to immediately disclose the virginity part, she can make it clear to her partners that sex is something that she wants to wait for until she feels a certain level of emotional intimacy with them. Later on, she can disclose the virginity part, but regardless of that, it sounds like her opinions about when she is ready have more to do with closeness than long-term guarantees. The first time I had sex, I waited until I was in love, and since then have felt more comfortable having a certain level of intimacy before allowing someone to be inside me. Don't worry so much about the title of virgin and instead just focus on what feels right for you. Hi, Dan. Not a question, just a comment. The guy who got an escort and then his wife was upset that it cost $400. Now, I'm a longtime sex worker, and $400 is actually not that much for an escort. If anybody thinks that an escort should cost less than $400, and I know that there are people who do charge less, this is our body and our lives. Like We're worth that much money and more. It just was really upsetting to hear somebody think that it wasn't worth it or that was too much. I understand some people have financial constraints, but like if you're going to get a sex worker, go into that arrangement knowing that that person is worth as much money as they ask for and more. Hi there. I'm calling about episode 592 and the woman who called about men who would only talk about themselves during dates. I think she should just stick to listening to them all the way through and and 
see how long they'll talk for. And then at the end of the date, when they inevitably try and hook up with her, just turn around and tell them that she w- wanted to hook up with them and then now thinks they're going to be way too selfish to uh, to be any good in bed. I think that probably will fix the problem. Before we leave you there this week, I want to let you know Minneapolis, Minnesota, Madison, Wisconsin, and Royal Oak just outside Detroit, Michigan. I am coming to town. Minneapolis, Friday, March 23rd at the Pantages Theater. Madison, Saturday, March 24th at the Barrymore Theater. And Royal Oak outside Detroit, Sunday, March 25th at the Royal Oak Music Theater. To get tickets for these Savage Love Live events, go to savagelovecast.com slash events. I will be taking your questions. We will be having a dialogue and having some fun. Please join me, Minneapolis, March 23rd, Madison, March 24th, Royal Oak, March 25th. Again, savagelovecast.com slash events for tickets. All right, we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to put a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Get your Savage Love t-shirts and coffee mugs and my books at savagelovecast.com. Click on shop and be sure to listen to Blabbermouth, the Strangers Weekly News and Politics podcast hosted by Eli Sanders with me and Rich Smith. Katie Herzog and other rotating regulars. Blabbermouth, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Emily Best on Twitter at Emily Best. Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy. We will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you. Thank you.